So this week, um, we're going to wrap up. This, I think, is the fourth week that I've done on. I've erased it, but uh, does anybody remember what, what subject I've been talking about the last four weeks? Uh, uh, glorification is motivation. Yeah, very good. Didn't even have to look at your notes. Good for you. So one person's been listening. Okay, and what's the other title <laughs> I gave? The other what? What's the other title I gave for this topic? Oh, something about uh, the future glorification being reason for uh, mm -hmm. kind of the Okay, good. Yeah, I also nicknamed it your best life then. Oh, good. yeah. The other one came ahead. All right, so okay. how did we learn that God will glorify us? Uh, scripture? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, no, that's a terrible <laughs> way. Uh, that's not a, in what way will uh, God glorify us? New bodies, honor. Okay, yeah. Yeah, new bodies, what else? Honor? Without sin. Yeah, that'll be nice, won't it? Wow. Authority in heaven, uh, in the new earth. Talks about being overseas or in judging angels. Um, now, why is it not wrong for us to seek this glory? Because it's pure. Okay, okay. And it's not so. Yeah, that's the key point right there. That um, because we're seeking honor from God rather than from men, right? And God told us to do that. And when we seek God's approval, when we seek glory from God, we're saying that His opinion is the one that matters most and that His reward <coughs> is so valuable that it's worth suffering and serving Him faithfully for now. Which leads us to our next question, which, um, what do we see that our rewards or our glory will be based on? Where? What? What will our reward? Well, not our own merits, but God's. Well, it's both. <laughs> what do you think? Where we are, um, God's love to us is conditional, so we have to be obedient to him, yet at the same time it's, 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 uh, Christ's righteousness is in this. So it's based on his merit. Okay, so uh, so let's see. Now it, it sounds like a contradiction there, doesn't it? Anybody have any more ways you want to try to muddy the waters before we. <laughs> let's see. Did you, do, you did good, Michael. We'll, um, we'll pull it out of the bucket in a minute here. <coughs> but, okay, so what are our rewards based on? Maybe I'll pull up those scripture that we looked at again here. Um, Everybody, oh, that's right. We've got scriptures to give out here too. So, Michael, if you want to hand these out, that's great. Um, but let's flip over to First Corinthians chapter three just for a minute to review this. First uh, Corinthians chapter three, and let's see. Look at starting in verse 7. And maybe Michael, um, Matthew, if you would read 1 Corinthians 3, 7 and 8. 3, 7 and 8? Mm -hmm. Okay, 3 is, For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh, behaving only in a human way? What chapter are you in? Okay. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Okay, but you said three. Oh, 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 okay. Three. You said, okay, I said oh, three twice. Oh, I'm sorry. Three, seven. Hey, you're right. Okay. <laughs> you said three. Read three, seven, and. Okay, okay. never mind. <laughs> so you want seven and eight? Yeah. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Okay, so. Who does the work? Who is it causes the growth? Yeah, that way. makes it a little more obvious. God causes the growth, but then um, who gets rewarded? Each. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, what's the reward based on? According to his wages. His labor. His labor, right. Okay, right. Um, 
let's see, jump down into Michael and read verses 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revered, uh, revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Okay. So you see, talking about our rewards are in some way based on or tied to our work, right? So um, as it's kind of been brought up a minute ago, does this nullify or contradict the idea that we are saved by grace through faith alone? Contradict. Yeah, does it, contra does it contradict salvation by grace through faith alone? What would you see there? Not at all. <clears throat> Why is that? Because our work, I mean, our reward is based on works. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is not based on works. Mm -hmm. And if works don't save, they are a fruit of their mm -hmm. salvation. Mm -hmm. So you might, you know, just look at it, it might be something like this. Salvation. Um, faith. So the it all starts. Um, it all starts with God, and although the rewards are contingent upon and based on our works, even the works that we do, the good works we do, are not things we can take credit for ultimately because they're the fruit of the faith that God's given us, causing us to to do the works. And we looked at that in more detail in past weeks. So and then last week we kind of talked about when is it that we will receive this glory. And we saw that scripture teaches that um, our glory will not be fully um, given to us until when? We die. Okay. And even, even um, there's even a more... Um, the day. Jesus. Yes. Hmm. The day, yes. Um, even when we <coughs> die, our glory will not be fully there until the day of resurrection, the day of judgment, um, the, the last day, when we will have our new bodies. Um, and so between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus, we see previews of his glory and authority and of our coming authority over all things. But as we looked at in Hebrews 2 last week, we do not yet see all things subjected to him or to us. John Piper uh, said this, this is the mystery or the secret of the kingdom, the arrival of the kingdom in a preliminary, small way in advance of the final consummation, when all the enemies would be defeated and all sin and satanic power and sickness and suffering would be gone forever. So you remember we talked about how, looking at it from the Old Testament point of view, they, they, they were thinking there's just going to be one coming of the Messiah, and it would be, everything would be made right after the one coming. <coughs> and now looking the prophecy we see how God's designed it so that there was a first coming dealing with sin and the, the, the age we're in now, which is kind of we have parts of the age of, uh, to come that have already come and been uh, re revealed, but the, um, the full glory waits the second coming of Jesus um, the mystery as George Latt again, again quoting from uh, Piper here the mystery as George Ladd puts it is fulfillment Without consummation, fulfillment of the kingdom is here, but consummation of the kingdom is not. Many kingdom blessings can be experienced today. Many are reserved for the consummation and the coming of Jesus. One illustration I thought of to kind of illustrate this would be sort of like if you lived in France, on the coast in Normandy, let's say, right after D-Day, you got liberated, you know, but there's still a war going on, right? You're, um, so in, in one way, you're kind of experiencing the the blessings already of the Allied um, takeover, but you know that there's still a lot yet to be done before you can really um, kick back and, and rejoice that the, the uh, day of glory has come. That's kind of what it's like for us now. We're living in that, in that middle time. Okay, another question we have talked about briefly, but we haven't answered yet, is if glorification future glory that awaits us, if that life justification is all ultimately from grace, 
why is it that there will be different degrees of glory for Christians? Mm-hmm. Well, because God has decreed it to be so. <laughs> 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 you can always kick back on to that, right? Why is 2 plus 2 4? Because God said so. Uh, why? <laughs> I'm you just teasing you, Michael. Yeah, yeah. What's you want to know why? Yeah, why? Because that's a good question. <laughs> Maybe Mike will know. They're going to be based on works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Based on what? On your works. Right, but here's what I'm saying. Why doesn't God cr- cause all Christians to do the same amount of works? Why? Yeah, or another, another way to say it is why doesn't God sanctify all Christians equally? Oh, you're talking the, this about side of, this side of that. They have a bunch of little robots. Maybe because he wants us to realize how much we need each other. Ooh. Wow, that was actually really good there, Michael. I like that. There's some truth in that. Um, good job. But first, let's just look at some of you have some verses that just kind of demonstrate that there will be different levels <coughs> of fruitfulness, of reward um, for Christians. Somebody has Matthew 13, 23. Yep, that would be me. Um, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another case in another sixty, and in another thirty. <coughs> good. The, uh, so you see there that even among the good seeds, not the seeds that get choked by the weeds, or the seeds that um, are on the thorny ground, or they get eaten by the birds, but the most the, the, seed, the seeds that go on the good soil, there's different levels of fruitfulness there. Um, somebody else has Luke 19, 15 to 19. It's me again. Wow. <laughs> today. Okay. Luke 19. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well good, well done, good, good servant, because you have been faithful, and a very little you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept, which I kept way away in a handkerchief. Uh, Wait, okay, yeah. I'm going so when you, the, the point there was, did the two good servants, did they produce equal results for the master with the minor that was given to them? No. No. One, one um, came back with ten, one came back with five. <coughs> and then the passage that Michael read earlier, which I won't have us read again in First Corinthians 3, talks about how you can build upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, and straw, and then the day will show the result uh, our works will be tested with fire and will be rewarded according to how they remain. So, um, so we see in Scripture clearly teaching that there will be different levels of fruitfulness or maturity um, upon which reward is based for Christians. And we've already noted that the only reason why we do any rewardable works is not because of any goodness of ourselves, but because of God's Spirit at work and God's people in our hearts changing us. Um, but God's Spirit is not limited to just making people either like, you know, minus 100 or plus 100 on the scale, you know. There's a whole series of gradients in between, and there will be degrees of punishment for non-believers in hell and degrees of reward in heaven for believers. Hmm. Someone has 1 Corinthians 15.10. Moreover, we are even found to be mm-hmm. even found to be fault witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Jesus, whom He did not raise. In fact, the dead are not raised. I think that's the wrong verse. It's at fifteen ten. Is that what I'm looking for? Oh, I didn't go up far enough. Okay. I'm sorry. No I was reading it and I was going. They probably needed to hear that verse too. <laughs> I think my battery is dying on this one. Can you go check and see if they can hear? 11, 
Okay, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not move in me. But I labored evil more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. That's right. So, do you see how that verse relates to what we were talking about? And it goes towards the sovereignty of God. Mm -hmm. you, you, you will be rewarded based on your works, but yet the works that you do are only given to you, and you're allowed to do them by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, so Paul's yeah. saying, you know, I, I labored more than anybody, but it wasn't really me. It was God's grace in me. Which, in a way, isn't that, isn't that just a neat side note that, you know, if you really want to be fruitful for God, the thing to concentrate on is God's grace, because that will produce in you, um, more work, more zeal, um, more passion for advancing his glory. And uh, the other point I wanted to make on that was, if we all knew that, that it was just kind of predetermined that we would all kind of get you know the same brownie points in the end, um, and that probably wouldn't motivate us to work as much as knowing that there will be different levels of reward based on our works. So God uses that as an incentive, a motivation for us. So, which comes down to, what should be the effect of everything we've looked at the last four weeks? What should be the impact? Um, what should it do in our hearts, everything we've looked at the last four weeks? Kind of like what Paul was thinking in this passage in Romans, or Paul is talking about running a race and not look back but go for the prize. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a, probably a good analogy of what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It should. Um, so, just okay, thank you. It should motivate us, shouldn't it, to, to run uh, faster or uh, with endurance the race that's set before us. And. Uh, knowing that we just have this brief window of time. You know, you can't schedule the race whenever you want it to be. We just have this brief window of time between now and Jesus' return in which to run. And it should motivate us to serve and suffer faithfully for the gospel now while we have opportunity. Does anybody have any other questions about what we've looked at these last few weeks? About our glory, about how God uses that to motivate us. So now we're going to go on to, I'm starting a new topic today, which I'll, I will teach on for the rest of the Sunday School Hour today and probably the next two Sundays as well. And um, let's see, let me get rid of this. And I got two titles for this one also. One that's kind of the highfalutin title that you can tell people when you want to impress them what you're going to say. And then ones that are simple that you'll be able to understand. Simple one. Now let me give you the, the complicated one first, okay? <laughs> okay. Seems the only for everyone and simple name. Now, some questions for you. What is what is church? Be more specific. <laughs> In what way? Church is different thing. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right. Biblically, what is church? Yeah. Uh, ecclesia. It yeah, is. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, we know that. All right, Greek. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, no, no, I'm just saying ecclesia. That that is the the, the root word right. that you're going to use to determine what the church is, mm -hmm. and that is the members of the body, the congregation. Okay, so it's the people. Uh, the body of Christ. Right. Right. The body yeah. of Christ. Okay, okay. Um, and which is um, who are those people? Well, leaders. Those are members. Okay, so so we're saying that the church equals. Believers. So, does that mean if 
you get a bunch of believers together in a room, is that a church? No. They are somewhere, right? Yeah, it could be. Not a church. They are members of the church. Okay, okay. They are nature. They may be the local body of the church. <laughs> okay, what were you saying, guys? I said it, it, it's based on their activities together. I mean, not just, you know, it's, it's based on their hearts and it's not just the fact that they're Christians and they're all together that they're in church. Mm -hmm. It's what their fruit comes from that. We could be eating, huh? <laughs> Can make some meal. Uh, do, uh, what do you mean by the fruit that comes from it? What they do with their beliefs, what they do with their, why they're getting together, not just, you know, okay. high fiving each other and saying we're a church, okay. but actually having, being able to let God work through them and okay, okay. express okay. that they are a church. Okay, okay. Um, so maybe we're seeing are we seeing believers who do something active? Um, okay, what are kind of some, something? So they have to be members. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Members, um, so, so uh, you're, you're saying they have to? You're, you're asking. Uh -huh, I'm asking. Okay. Okay, we'll just put that up there as a question. Okay. Members? Okay. They would have to be members as far as being bought with the blood of Christ. Oh, it's, you're not going to be either a leader or part of the church. Okay, yeah, okay, okay so if you're a member members of the Members of the family. The family, okay. Just because you're a member of a church doesn't mean you're safe. Okay, right? that's true, exactly. too. Right? That's members sure. of the household of God. Okay. Um, so let's see, here's another way to, another question here. Um, does it, for a church to be a church, do people have to gather together at the same place at the same time? No. no. Are you talking about the two aspects of the church universal and the but that, church that's universal and that's church true. local? That's true too, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, ch the church universal is all of God's elect. Mm -hmm. For all it doesn't time. matter what denomination they belong to, what church they belong to. That's the universal aspect of the church. We are all part. Mm -hmm. and all, anyone who's a genuine Christian is part of that. And all, <coughs> all eras of time are part of that. Not right. just, yeah. And then you have the, the local aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where the trouble starts, right? <laughs> well, there, there will be certain <laughs> biblical elements to that, to that church. I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, I bet you were going to go there. Yeah. Um, uh, what's the saying about to dwell above what seems to be love? I mean, is it? I truly will be glory to all the love of saints. We, we know that's a different story. <laughs> the, uh, um, but, um, is there a certain number of people that you need to have to have a church? That's what I'm talking about, a local church now. No. More than one. More than one? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Okay. Um, no. Like, what about if we just decided, you know, I'm just going to stay home with my family and have church at home? Is that, is that no. true? Okay, why not? Because the scripture says we need to get it. Okay, it's the assembly. Well, you, you got your family. You might just, um, uh. There's three of us. We could, we could just have the Barch Church, right? Well, what if you're in a country where there's persecution? Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, what about that? What if, what if it's too dangerous to gather together? You could just send each other emails and encourage each other that way, right? Emails? <laughs> Or you know, what about? Okay, so what? Uh, like Egypt meeting in the catacombs. Or Rome? Yeah, that's it. I mean, now they're doing it now. You know, in the outside of Cairo, where they they got the huge. No, oh, in the cave church. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, one reason why. This is an important topic to talk about is because the institution, uh, the organization, the organism of the church um, has um, suffered, um, how do you describe this? People don't, we, we, we tend to not think about the church very deeply. And I'm trying to, and I'll have a few more questions for you in a minute here, um, but not really thinking about what does the Bible really teach about the church has led to 
people coming to all kinds of ideas, even questioning the need for the church as it's described in the New Testament. Like, um, I remember a couple years ago talking to a guy on Skype. Um, he was in uh, Northern Ireland, and he doesn't go to church anywhere. Of course, churches are a little harder to come by there than they are here, but there are still some churches that um, teach the gospel in Northern Ireland. And, he was like, you know, I don't go to church. You know, t me talking to you on Skype is church. For me. You know, two two um, brothers in the Lord talking on Skype. You know, um, why can't that be church? And um, is that building over there for Southern Baptist Church? That, okay, there's another question. Is the church the building? I think we all were able to answer that. Okay, okay, at least we agree on that. Um, and then in a much more um, appealing format than the guy from Northern Ireland, much more widely read. George Barna. Uh, but the sign says it is. Oh, yeah. It's got to be a church if the sign says so, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, George Barna, in recent years, has um, studied uh, demographics in the U.S. and has come to the conclusion that more and more uh, professing Christians are choosing to, rather than get their spirituality from a regular church involvement, are just kind of doing buffet style and just kind of, you know, maybe they'll go to this group of people for Bible study, maybe they'll go here for a prayer meeting, and, you know, they'll listen to some good teachers on the radio or internet or whatever, and just kind of um, mix and match the, the kind of spiritual input they want for, to de design their own sort of personal spiritual growth uh, plan. And rather than even needing or feeling um, connected with a, a, a church in a, in a formal way, they're just kind of out. He calls them revolutionaries, and he wrote a book about that. And Barna actually sees that as being a good trend, that Christians are becoming more responsible and, and uh, um, um, self-directing in their um, spiritual growth. Uh, so let me go back to some more questions here. What is the reason the church exists. Why did Jesus even create the church? What was the purpose for the church? To display God's glory. Okay. To okay. display God. To display God. And why doesn't that, wouldn't that just happen just with individual Christians? Why do we need to have a just individual Christians goes against the meaning of ecclesia, which is really kind of wrongly translated as church in a lot of things. It, should, it, it really is assembly. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll get to that. In a <laughs> okay. Which one um, person cannot assemble unless there are other. Yeah, but I'm asking um, why couldn't God, you, you said that the church exists to display God's glory. Yes. So I'm going back and asking the question, why couldn't God display his glory just through individual Christians? What? What, how does how does an assembly of Christians help display God's glory more than uh, individual Christians? God God is I mean, well, the doctrine of the Trinity. God is not just one person; mm -hmm. it's three persons who interact. Um, okay. So you can't display that that interaction. You can't display the love of God um, unless you have. So I mean, I can't sit in my house and just think warm thoughts towards you, and you can't love me sitting at home. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, more humans doing anything, good or bad, is, is a powerful example to yeah, the outside right. world than just a few people. Okay. Okay. You know, the church um, rock moments in in um, Israel. He has a church of uh, Hebrew, of Jews, uh, of of uh, Russian. <coughs> that would not normally associate together and the fact that these people are together worshiping together, mm -hmm. that speaks volumes to the world mm -hmm. and what the love of God can do. Good point. Mm -hmm. Can't serve, can't display love. Mm -hmm. All things just can't. Good. Do it. Good, good, good. Okay. Now then, we kind of talk about what's the, the purpose of the church and then drill down a little more specifically. <coughs> what is the purpose of the church meeting? The actual coming together of the people worship. To learn the word of God. Okay. 
right? Okay, so let me do everything. So you got worship, example. What do you mean by that? Well, sharing it, it shares with the world that our love goes beyond our just our relationship with Christ. But okay, so that, okay, I can just play. It's right. to be grown, not not to individual growth and corporate growth. Okay, what do you mean by that, Michael? What does individual growth mean? You get taller? I mean, I mean huh? You get taller? <laughs> yeah, yeah, when are you going to share some with us? No. <laughs> uh, spiritual growth. You know, listening to teaching. Okay, good teaching. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Now, how about accountability? Okay, mm-hmm. okay what do you mean by that? Oh, okay. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, if you're all by yourself, sitting in words yourself, you can easily get off on a tangent. Mm-hmm. That's not good. Mm-hmm. You need other people's teaching mm-hmm. to keep you centered okay. in the faith. Okay. okay. Like encouragement. Encouragement. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, do you, what do you mean by encouragement? Well, sort of the, the good, you know, accountability. You know, okay. So if people say, you know, you really did a good job in such and such. Okay. Where you're learning the right way. Or okay. Okay. So it's not all negative, but it could be positive reinforcement. Okay. Now, how many of these things can you get outside of the church? I'm not saying how many should you get necessarily outside, of, but how many can you get outside of the church? Well, you oh. can worship oh. anywhere. Yeah. Okay, you can worship anywhere, right? Okay. Yeah. And in you fact, learn. you can learn. You can get on the internet or just study your Bible yourself or watch on watch the TV preachers or whatever, right? Um, Accountability is tricky. Uh, yeah, yeah. How would you do that for yourself? Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard. Yeah, okay. Um, growth you can do. Uh, the display is also going to be difficult. Mm-hmm. But even your growth is limited. Yeah, you're not sure if you're growing the right way. <laughs> okay, good point. <laughs> you say proper growth. You say yeah, that's growth. true. <laughs> okay. Control growth. How does that? Okay. It helps. It helps other unbelievers to know that we truly are different. Because if we just say, I'm a Christian, I don't go to the church, they're going to be like, okay. Okay. Okay, well, they might think that's a good idea. Actually, some of them believe, yeah, I am too, or whatever. Um, But if they know that we are a part of a a body of believers that are centered around the Bible, then they'll be like, oh, so you really are serious about this stuff. Especially the cultural world. You need for protection too, because that's how cults get started. All you need is me and my Bible and nobody else. Mm-hmm. And they check you from going to nerve. Here's another question for you Are there things that you and, and I, as individuals, that we can, can do or should do that the church shouldn't do? Can you say that again? Yeah, okay. Are there things that, that we can do or should do? That the church shouldn't do. Shouldn't? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The church shouldn't. Should. Once, once you hear the answer, you'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, that's obvious. But I'm trying to make you think. What do you mean, like daily personal devotions rather than going to church every single mm-hmm. day? Okay. No, I'm, yeah, I mean, even more broadly than that. Like, I'll give you just a really obvious example. You know, um, Should the church have a ministry that changes the oil in your car? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> change a little what did you say? <laughs> to change the oil in your car. Huh? Okay. So yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Michael, I think you got a new job. Then. <laughs> You're our new minister of oil changing. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't change the oil in all my cars. So. <laughs> oh, special. Uh, let's see. The uh, um, so my point in asking that question was to see. Okay, there's a whole broad spectrum that, of, of things that we do, right, as Christians. Okay, let me narrow it down a little bit. No, let's just think uh, kind of worse because the end of going on just more spiritual things. Um, what would be... Okay, this, this may be a little controversial, so, so we'll see how this goes, but and we'll talk about it more in coming weeks. But um, should we as individuals care for poor people as Christians? Physical need? Mm, physical needs, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a kind of... 
Oh, no, this question wasn't supposed to be controversial. Uh, yeah. Are we supposed to care for poor people? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, is the church is that the church's mission to care for poor people? Mm -hmm. no. No. Not really. Yes. No. Okay. And that's the, that's the more controversial or complicated question there, which we will come back to more in different uh, in, in future weeks. But okay. Now, so we we asked, are there things that we as individuals should do that the church maybe shouldn't do? Uh, another example would be your uh, husbands, Christian husbands, are supposed to do what to their wives? Uh, their wives. Love okay, right. Just call you love and now, support. is there a difference in the way that uh, a man w will love his wife versus the way he'll love other wives in the church? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. well, that's another obvious right example. Right. So, <laughs> so. Okay, now let's look at the flip side of the question. Are there things that the church should do? that we as individuals sh shouldn't do. Yes. Okay, what's an example of that? Um, the Lord's Supper. <coughs> okay, that's for good, good, okay, what else? <laughs> no, that's, so that's a good example. Yeah, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't just use Discipline. It. Yes, very good. Um, we, don't excommuni we don't excommunicate people um, <laughs> on our own. Right? We should. You know, Peggy, you offended me today, so I'm gonna excommunicate you, right? <laughs> so, um, they have to be members too. If yeah. you're not yes. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. Yeah. So now here's another question. What is the difference in the relationship between two Christians who belong to the same church, same local church, versus two Christians who belong to two different churches? Let's say you know they're both Bible teaching churches. Mm -hmm. They're both really, really Christians. But what's the difference in the relationship between two Christians who belong to the same church and two Christians who belong to different churches? To reiterate, one thing would be discipline. Mm -hmm. The other is um, accountability to authority. Mm -hmm. Very good. There's one more. What's that? Covenant. Mm -hmm. Our responsibilities are higher for people in the same local church than they are mm -hmm. to. Um, I mean, we we do have we should we should you know pray for and care about all believers everywhere, right? Do good to the household of faith. Um, but at the same time, we have a, just like again, kind of using the family illustration, your responsibilities to your kids are different than they are to somebody, somebody else's kids, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the, Michael already told us what is the Greek word for church is. Ecclesia. 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 Yes. Which is where the word ecclesiology comes from. Um, Someone yeah. likes Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> what? What is it in Spanish? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. That's right. With a G, right? Yeah. But I, yeah, that's right. It's I G. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, in um, I G. Yeah. Um, in Greek, transliterated. Yeah. It's used a little bit over 110 times in the New Testament. But only 15. 115? <laughs> okay. <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I read said 115, another thing said 111, so that's why I was being <laughs> generic. Um, Conservative. Yes. 115 what? Uh, the, the Greek word ecclesia is used 115 or so times in the New really? Testament. Ecclesia. Okay. <laughs> That'll be our designated pronouncer. <laughs> but only two of those times, only two of those times are in the Gospels. The rest of the times are from Acts on. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to look at at least one of the two times in the Gospels. And the two times are only in Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John do not mention Ecclesia at all. So somebody has Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. If you would read that passage, and then if everybody would turn there, because this is one of our key passages. We're beginning to understand what the Bible says. Our uh, church is supposed to be Matthew, what? Matthew chapter 16. 13 to 20. 13 to 20, yeah. Somebody has a slip yep. to read one. Now then Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, Philippi. He was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Peter, because flesh and bone did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church 
and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the power or the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, I shall have bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, shall I have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Good, thank you. Okay. Then, then verse 19, have you me used? Yeah, that's, that's a, those are tough verses, aren't they? To understand and to figure out what's happening here. But we'll kind of work through this. Um, before Jesus said this, did the church exist? No. Michael says yes, everybody else says no. What do you think? If the church is body of believers from time immemorial in the future, then those people existed, yes. Those people were selected of God. They were members of that assembly. Okay. And then, in what sense, um, looking at this passage, though, in what sense does Jesus seem to be saying he's going to create something new? Church and, and the Spirit actually okay. being involved in, in the church, Good. and then going about setting up what the church should look like, the, its government. And mm-hmm. Okay. Good. I will do it. Yeah. There, okay. There we go. That's the part I was I was looking for in, in this in this chunk we're looking at here. But that's you're giving good context, Michael. But right here, I will build something that's future is yeah. going to be happening. Okay. Which leads to the second question: Who is who is it that's actually going to build this new institution? Not Peter. <laughs> Not Peter. Okay, that's right. Holy Spirit. But more specifically, what's it say in the passage here? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus said, I will build my church. Which, is, build my church. which is always a great encouragement to me when I remember that. He is the one who will do that. Now, what other words could he have used instead of build that would have given a different slant there? What are we, what's... Assemble. Okay, okay, right. He could say, I will assemble my church, okay. Uh, what other words could he have used there? Begin. You can begin, right? Okay. Okay. What is there about? What's kind of this, the special uh, nuance of the word build there? He starts with a little something and then it builds. Yes. Good. Good. You, you're, you're, you're tracking today. <laughs> <laughs> At least one person's understanding where I'm going. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a process. It's not immediate. It's not going to just be a sudden, instantaneous creation from from zero to sixty three seconds, right? He's mm-hmm. going to build it. It will take time and effort. And then, what is it that Jesus is going to build his church on? The rock. Well, what is the rock? Yeah, what is the rock? Right. Here. I see the rock. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus is saying he's going to build it on the rock. So the, the rock is probably not Jesus here. The word of God. Say the word of God, okay. Is that Peter? <laughs> okay. We say upon this rock I will build my church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like looking at a, a the confession. Okay, you're getting closer. He's really, <laughs> more, he's really build, gonna build it on persecution because as soon as persecution comes in, it just explodes. Sometimes Jesus is crucified. <laughs> <laughs> and raising. No, no, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm looking at a footnote here. Uh, uh, says that the Greek words for Peter and rock sound similar. That's right. Um, Peter is Petros, and the word for rock there is Petra. So could it be one and the same? Petros, be, be, uh, Peter's name means a stone, and then Petra means a large right. bedrock. So that, that goes against what the Catholics say, because the stone is not a right. stone. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. You're good. You're getting yeah, okay. You're getting kind of into the idea of Peter's confession there, because um, what did Peter just what did, what did Jesus has just asked? Who do people say? Who do you say I am? Mm-hmm. And, and Peter. the Christ. He's mm-hmm. going to live again. Okay. So, um, so, so sometimes people, as they, they study this, they come to the conclusion that what the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on is that confession: "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." And uh, Jonathan, you uh, meant to say that. The, the study we're doing these three weeks, um, I will be pulling some things from these two books here. Church Membership by Jonathan Lehman, um, 
she has a, just a good couple of chapters on what is a church and um, the mis- what is the mission of the church by Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert. Um, and Jonathan Lehman, I mean, this book does a, a nice job of, saying, of kind of explaining this passage and saying that the rock that Jesus will build his church on is not just a person, and it's not just the words of Peter, not just the confession, but it's on confessors. We might say people, Jesus will uh, build his church not on words and not on people, but on people who believe the right gospel words. So people who confess that Jesus is the Christ. Um, and we will hit more on that in the next passage in Matthew that mentions the church. Um, but what is it that Jesus says in this section uh, here in Matthew 16, what does he say that the church will do? Can we back up a little bit? Sure, go for it. I'm just a little confused. Um, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, mm-hmm. which on everything is built on. Mm-hmm. So at times I'm just confused if that's what he says, people confessing. I don't see how that makes any difference. Christ is the cornerstone, and everything else is built off. Off of that, so it, it is the confession. It is the gospel. It is the confession of, of Peter. Mm-hmm. I don't know where he's going with that. I I've never heard that. Okay. But Christ is the chief cornerstone. Mm-hmm. So he always gets all the glory. It's not built on anything else. So I I, I don't know. I'm just throwing that up because I'm just a little confused about that statement. And I, I probably should. Have, what I'll do is I'll study some more <coughs> on that this week and try to explain it better next week because I I went kind of quickly on that trying to get to where I was going in, in this, but, but I'll try to clarify it. Uh, I, I don't think there's any disagreement between us on the issue, but he, he was saying that um, it's not just, the church isn't just built on words, but it's built on people who embrace those words. The church is made up of people who embrace the, the truth about Jesus, not just the truth. Well, does that make sense? I, and that's what I, I understand you to say, but... It, it, but I, I don't. It's not. It's built on Jesus Christ Himself, a person, not just words about a person, or not just what I believe about those words. Mm-hmm. It's actually built on a person. It's built on built on Jesus Christ Himself. <laughs> Otherwise, we've got some kind of. It just sounds like some kind of weird okay. idolatry going on. It's it's Christ. He's the chief cornerstone. Everything is built off of Him. Whether whoever believes it or not, it, that's He's the chief cornerstone. So I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to be controversial. No, no, I'm trying, I, I appreciate trying to understand his, his statement. Yeah, and he probably would do a better job of explaining it than I would. So I'll, but I'll dig into that more this week, and um, we'll try to, to uh, clarify that next week. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, in this passage now, what does it say that the church will do, or can it imply that the church will do? Not be overpowered, does that? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, which means now are, are gates an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon? Defense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, now <clears throat> it says the gates of Hades or gates of, gates of hell. Did anybody you have something different there for a translation of Hades? <clears throat> gates of. Gates of hell. Gates of hell, okay. So what are the gates of hell? What is what? What are the gates of hell? It says the gates of hell will not overpower the church, so the church will be able to conquer the gates of hell. What does that mean? Satan is used. Okay. Let's look at some passages in the Old Testament. A couple of you, sh- one of you should have should have Job thirty eight seventeen. Hmm. Um, that we, uh, That's me. Okay. Um, it says uh, having the gates of death. Oh, have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Okay, okay, gates of death, okay. Anybody else has Isaiah 38, 10? I said, in the middle of my days I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. Mm-hmm. That's where Hezekiah was on his deathbed. Said that. Um, Psalm 9, 13 says, be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me, O you who lift me up from the gates of death. In Psalm 107.18 says, They loathe any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. 
So when Jesus was using this expression, the gates of Hades, he was using an Old Testament expression referring to death. So it sounds like he's saying something here that the church in some way will overcome, conquer death. The death gates will not overpower the church. Okay? Uh, let's see, who does the church, who do we see in this passage that the church belongs to? Just kind of a... Well, what's Jesus? Yeah, okay, so I'll build my church, right? <coughs> okay. <coughs> And what is it, what can we, we see? It's hard just to see just from this passage, but what do we see here? What do the keys do? The keys do. Give a key. They open. Uh, okay. Okay. What else do they do in this passage? Or they bind. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> they bind or they loose, okay. Good. Okay. Power with God. Here's what Jonathan Lehman says about the keys. Jesus then gave Peter and the apostles the keys of the kingdom, which gave Peter the authority to do what Jesus had just done with him, to act as God's official representative on earth for affirming true gospel confessions and confessors. And we'll see if we have time to see some help. Real time things here. Oh, we have a little more time. Okay, good. But, so let's... Uh, this passage here that we're looking at, is this talking mainly about the universal church or about the local church? Yeah, the local church. It's, I mean, the keys are the... Okay, okay there's, there's truth there. Mm -hmm. and as far as uh, just in verse 18, is that talking local or universal? Universal. Is he was going to build his church, and so that that applies not just to local churches, but to the church universal, right? Okay. Now let's go over to the second passage in the Gospels that talks about the church. Matthew chapter eighteen, verses twelve to twenty. Somebody has that slip of paper. Uh, I do. Oh, here. I have a better set of coffee. Um. <coughs> <clears throat> Would you read it, please? I didn't mean to make you cry. Uh, what do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go and search for the one that is astray? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the other ninety-nine, which have not gone astray. Thus, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax gatherer. Truly, I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Thank okay. you. First, just want to point out that <coughs> you see that one uh, thing that's said almost the same way in both passages. You notice that in Christ. In Matthew 16, Matthew 18, there's one verse that's, that's very similar. Anybody notice that? One 
verses similar in both chapters. 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the verse about binding and loosing, right? It's almost, almost identical between the two verses. Now, in Matthew 18, <coughs> what kind of people is Jesus talking about that are a part of this church? <coughs> Believers. Okay, where do, you, where do you see that in this passage? Matthew. Um, talking about the church. Okay, how do we know that? I mean, well, I mean, it says church, well, obviously, but I mean, what kind of people does this passage kind of say are part of the church? Start on 15. Okay, what, what about, about believers? Okay, how do we know when 15 is talking about believers? Brother. Brother, okay, you got to have brother. Okay, See brothers, right, you. okay. What other names does he give <coughs> to believers in this in this passage that we looked at? Sheep. Sheep, good, okay, good. Sheep oh, yeah. is in, it's, is used throughout scripture as a, a uh, symbol or an analogy for God's people. Um, not necessarily a complimentary analogy, but <coughs> anyway. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, what about in verse 14? What kind of name does he give to believers there? Verse what? 14. Little ones. Little ones, yeah. Yeah, okay. What kind of things does this passage specifically say that it is supposed to be told to the church? Sin. Mm -hmm. Sin of who? Of a brother. Of a brother, right. Okay, so it's a sin of a, of a, of a professing believer, not, not just a sin of, you know, somebody out in the community in general, but a sin of a, of a brother. And what kind of a person is the church to speak to, according to this passage? Witnesses. What kind of person? Yeah, what kind of a person? In this passage specifically, it says that the church should talk to somebody in a certain situation. An unrepentant person. An unrepentant, what kind of a person? A sinner. Sin. Brother. 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 And what does this passage say is the purpose of that activity? What is the purpose of the church talking to an unrepentant brother, according to this passage? To bring about repentance and restoration. Uh, from the passage. To be to save. Okay, good. In which verse do you see that? Fifteen. One your brother. That's what you're after. You're going to gain your brother. Okay. Um, and what is it that will be prevented by gaining your brother? In verse 14, what is it that this activity prevents from happening? Um, perish. Perish. Yeah. No, the, yeah. the, the brother would perish without this activity happening, right? Okay. Now, how does the story about the sheep, the hundred sheep, relate to what he talks about then about the church um, going and talking to an unrepentant brother? What's the, what's the connection? That you, you know, he talks about the sheep and the shepherd going and searching for the one sheep, leaving the ninety-nine. And then he goes over and talks about okay, the church, you know, if, if there's an unrepentant brother, go talk to him. What's the connection between those two things? Let's see. Go ahead. So that you end up caring more for that brother? What's that? Did you end up caring more for that brother? Okay, okay. And, uh, like, in the, in the first story, the, the one lost sheep, who is that lost sheep equivalent to in the second one, where he's actually talking about people instead of sheep? Who's the, who's the lost sheep? The one the brother. Sheep. Okay, the brother in sin, right? Okay. In, in, the, in the sheep story, who goes after the sheep? The shepherd. The shepherd. Okay. Oh. And in, no. Jesus. in the second thing, who is it that goes after the straying brother? Brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another brother. So, how is it that the shepherd pursues a strange sheep? Remember the church. Uh huh. 
he sends the 99 after him, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so who is it, according to this passage, that gets to do the binding and loosing? We're almost done here. I appreciate your patience. I just wanted to, get to reach a stopping point so we can... Um, who does the binding? Who does the binding and loosing? That's right. According to this passage. The church. The church. Good. Okay. Whose authority is wielded when the church does that binding and loosing? The elder? Mm, bigger than that. Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. God, Jesus, the right. I see. No, um, and and like, like the story of the shepherd again, the shepherd is the one who pursues the sheep, but in um, church discipline, it, the shepherd uses the members of the church right, to pursue the, the, the sheep that's straying. So it's, but it's the shepherd's authority. Is the sh and that's what he says in verse 20, where two or three have gathered together in my name, in my name, that's with his authority. There I am in their midst. Um, so let me just summarize what we've seen so far, and we will pick up again here next week. So putting the two passages we looked at, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, we've seen that the church would be built by Jesus, given the authority of Jesus, to preserve his followers from perishing. We saw in verse 14 there. Maybe there's a connection there between that perishing in, in here and Hades back in chapter 16. But, uh, that's something just to think about. The church will affirm true confessors and... Um, Jonathan Lehman uses the illustration that he was in Belgium um, studying as a student when he was younger, and his passport expired while he was there. So he went to the U.S. Embassy to get his passport renewed, in which they did. Um, the, the embassy didn't make him a citizen, but it validated that he was a citizen during that process. And so in the same, in the same way, the church doesn't make us Christians, but it verifies or validates that we are Christians in a way that we cannot do it on our own. Okay, so we can start to see just from these two passages an, an answer to the questions we were talking about earlier, which is, what is it that the church can do that no other gathering or institution of Christians can do? But we'll, we will pick up there again next week. In, any questions, things you want to clarify? Okay, thank you all for your patience. Um, maybe Josh, could you try to do Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time to study your word, a uh, closer examination of uh, who your Son Jesus Christ is. And who you say that he is, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to uh, do a mighty work in us, that we would be uh, closer to Jesus than we ever have before, Lord, that we would study your word, that we would be diligent in doing so, and that the gospel would be prevalent in our lives. And these things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.